first thing to remind you guys, I was out of town this weekend. I left Friday, actually, office hours. That's why I was doing office hours online, just because I had to, I was essentially getting ready to get on the road. So, because of that, I'm behind on grading and emails, so as usual, I apologize for that. And I'll let you guys know when I am caught up, at least with emails. Uh, some of the grading kind of goes way back. Um, what else? Because of the fact that I was traveling this weekend, I never posted the video from Friday. So if you were wondering if you've gone crazy or you missed it, no, you haven't. I just haven't posted it yet. So for attendance video for Friday, I'll have that up for you today. So it's a little bit behind. You won't be kind of late for it. So, you know, that's the, the, good, the good news. And what else? And then the other thing is, once again, this weekend I'll be traveling as well. Same situation. So office hours are going to be online on Friday. Um, yeah, and I will be out of town, so it'll be just pretty much just like it was this week. So yeah, a lot of out of town stuff. Got some new attendance here. The other verbal reminder I want to make is that from now on, lab will not be. I know I just changed it, but there's only one lab left, and that's this week, right? So that's not going to be in person because it's an online thing anyway, and it's a, you're just going to watch a video of a documentary and answer questions that you do watched it so very easy you shouldn't need any help but if you do let me know and then next week the week after that is thanksgiving week so obviously we won't be here at all and the week after that will be the last week of class and we're not doing a new lab and i'm going to send more information about this later but basically your old your worship lab grade that's going to be your lab grade for the last week which sounds horrible right because that's not fair but the good news is what i'm what i'm getting at is for the last week of lab Go and pick your last lab, your worst lab, and I'll tell you which one it is, and just fix it. That's all you're doing. So instead of doing a new lab, you're just going to redo an old lab. For last week. Right? Yeah, for the last week lab. So there'll be nothing new. You get to fix the grade for that week, you know, and you'll get to fix the grade for the last week. So you'll get basically double the grades when you think about it. And of course, if you're just really doing really good in this class and want to focus on something else, then you can just keep your lowest grade. Maybe your lowest grade is like a high B for lab, and you're just like, eh, I don't feel like redoing it. In which case, you don't have to. So it's up to you whether or not you want to keep that grade or whether you want to fix it. That make sense? All right. So then the last reminder, you know, we're on chapter 19. There's only one more chapter after this. So we're coming down to crunch time. If you guys need help passing the class, let me know. I'm going to stop beating dead horses, but do the things you need to do. Read the book, show up to class, do the work, come to me for help. Yeah, that's it. So anything, any, any questions? All right, let's jump into chapter 19. I think this is a fun chapter. Of course, I think all the last chapters are fun, because as I mentioned earlier, I'm more into the big picture stuff. I like to see how organisms interact with themselves and the environment, as opposed to seeing how organelles react inside of the um, cell. And that's the kind of stuff we're dealing with. In my opinion, this is probably one of the easier chapters. I hope. Hopefully this one and the next one is kind of easy. Hopefully uh, everything I teach you, you probably think, oh, yeah, that's common sense. I think I kind of knew that. So basically, I'll just be proving some new stuff to you and putting some words to it, most likely. So we're talking about population ecology. Um, and this is a very relevant thing. Um, does anybody, can we, you can obviously tell they're fishing, but any guesses why we're taking that, why we're, uh, why you would have that? Why population ecology matters? Is it because of the amount of fish they take Exactly, yeah. So the idea here is that, and you're going to learn in this chapter, that we are over-harvesting fish. Generally speaking, humans are over-harvesting fish, and that's obviously a bad thing, not just for the fish, but because we depend on, we depend on the fish. So that may, you know, that's going to harm us because we'll be out of a food supply. And even more importantly, these fish are part of an ecosystem. And you're going to learn all about how ecosystems work. And the fact that you're taking away a whole species, it's not just like we lose that whole species. And we lose everything else that's connected to it. And this is a really relevant conversation today because by my estimates, it's either going to be today or tomorrow that we're going to hit 8 billion people on Earth. I've been watching the clock, and we're at like 800, excuse me, 700, 7 billion, 999,852, right about now. So today might be the day we hit 8 billion. Anyway, same thing here. Obviously, that's a landfill. So the idea there is, you know, we have a lot of people we're producing a lot of trash. That's not a good thing. Um, yeah, and then the, the people, the long line of people. I think we've have we already covered this. Have I lost my mind? Yeah, I think we did. So. Yeah, do you remember how far we got? Uh, <laughs> You're right. Is this all coming back to me? 
Yep, we did. I'm sorry, guys. Way, way behind. There we go. Thank you. Yes. I apologize. It's exhausting weekend. Population growth models. Here we go. We talked about exponential. I did that on purpose so we can re re refresh this. So we talked about exponential growth, which is like when things like the population explodes. And in a way, human population growth is still exponential because that's what our graph still looks like, the J-shaped curve. Then we talked about uh, the logistic growth, uh, population growth model, which is more realistic and more normal. That's when you have these limiting factors, which are things that keep the, um, the population from growing. And you get what's called an S-shaped curve, like that. And that's what you need to recognize for the exam. All right. Yes, that's what we left out. So I'll come back to you now. And we mentioned the fact that um, both of these are theoretical ideas of population growth, right? So if I back up, you can see the dots represent the actual data and the, the, the lines kind of represents like the average, right? So it's not like it falls always right there on the line. Sometimes it goes above the carrying capacity, sometimes it goes below it. Um, yeah. So there's that. Here's a slide that compares both an exponential growth and a logistic growth. And again, for the exam, and you'll get this test question, or you'll get a question like this on the study guide. Um, for exponential growth, you need to recognize it as a J-shaped curve. For exponential or logistic growth, you should recognize that S-shaped curve. All right. So, like I said, there's things that make this logistic growth, right? There's things in nature that keep it from going like this and start making it go like this. We call those things limiting factors. And that's what we're about to learn a little bit more about right now. Um, first thing we're going to talk about is density dependent factors. So you need to know what this is for an exam, for the exam. Density dependent factors are limiting factors whose intensity is related to the population density. That's the most important part right there. Oops. This second bullet point, I don't want to say it's less important. But that second bullet point can also be applied to uh, to the next uh, dependent factor you're going to learn about. The density increment. So again, the important thing here is this one right here. Density dependent factors are limiting factors. Here's a real important part: whose intensity is related to the population density. So, for example, example, COVID nineteen would be a density dependent factor for humans, right? Because if you live out in Alaska and there's five people that live in your town and you barely ever see them, right? That's a low population density. Therefore, you're probably going to be less likely to catch COVID. Now, if you live in New York City with a high population density and there's people everywhere, then you're probably more likely to catch COVID, right? So, again, that's what we, when we say density dependent, that's the density we're talking about, population density. Um, your book gives us an example of intraspecific competition, and you need to know what that is. And that is the comp competition between the same species for limited resources. And the most important thing here is the competition between the same species. If you can remember that, you can remember the rest. Because if I ask you that on the exam, that's going to be the key, the key part of the sentence. Competition between the same species. So when you think about like an interstate, right? An interstate brings you between different states, right? So the same thing you're going to learn later. Interspecific, which is not this, but the opposite. Interspecific competition is competition between species. Intraspecific, right there, that is the competition between the same species, a set of different species. Um, the first word for attendance is going to be this. We'll circle it, right there it is. Draw an arrow to it. There we go, first word for attendance. So, are there any questions so far about what density dependent factors are? All right, um, this next bullet point, this kind of goes without saying. I, almost, I am going to put it next to this. Yes, you need to know it, but that's not unique to density dependent. Yes, it does lower the birth rate. Yes, it does increase the death rate. In other words, a density dependent factor is <coughs> slow population growth, but the same thing can be said for density independent. So, really, I just need to adjust this PowerPoint and get rid of that bullet point. Because, yes, it's true, but it doesn't make it unique, it doesn't make it different than um, density independent. Your book gives some examples. I'm also going to put it next to this because when you're studying it, I don't want you to memorize those examples, right? You need to understand just in general the, the concept. And I might give you a hypothetical example, but it won't be from here. So you just need to recognize it as something if it's killing, if it's killing things off, um, and it's dependent on the population density. Then you should know it's density dependent factor. But 
The book examples is talked about it would be like the accumulation of toxic waste products. We don't usually think about that too much as humans, but if you think about like a colony of bacteria on a petri dish, you know, some of the stuff that they produce are things that they don't need and that can become toxic to them and it can kill them. Uh, that's just one example. Uh, disease transmission under crowded conditions, that's the one I've already gave an example for, right? So if we talk about COVID-19, you know, you're more likely to catch that in a place like New York City than you would be in Montana, right? Because the more people you have, um, or not just people, but any species, the more they're crowded together, the more likely you want to get. Um, limited food, so I don't want to go into too much detail on that, but if I could go on and on, but that might muddy the waters. So just recognize that as, um, as an example, limited food, limited water, right? Um, and limited shelter. So all the things that are dependent on the population density. So any, any questions about that, about density dependent? All right, we'll move forward. Um, this graph shows you um, right here the mean number of offspring per female. So nature kind of balances itself out. As you can see here, as this pop, they're looking at this population of uh, birds, and as the population increases, the population density, excuse me, the population density increases, so the more they are crowded together, then the fewer offspring these things have, right? So you can see how the number goes way down. And that's nature's way of doing things, right? So because there's crowded conditions and probably less food, less shelter, less water, all that stuff, then you would need fewer offspring because if you have a lot of them, they're not likely to make it. Um, and the same kind of thing you can say here, uh, we're looking at perch, uh, but in this case, instead of looking at births for these fish, we're looking at death. So you can see as the population number increases, the population density increases, then so does the death rate. It also increases. Because these things hide in kelp, so the more crowded it is, the fewer hiding places there are, and therefore the more likely they are to be eaten by predators. So again, this is basically just showing you density-dependent density factors, how it can slow um, population growth by declining birth rates and increasing death rates. And of course, this is just an example. Obviously, you don't need to memorize anything on that graph. If anything, and I keep saying this, but I never do it, but, but uh, you know, if anything, maybe I'll give you this graph on an exam and ask you to interpret it. So I might say, you know, when, with the birds, when there was a density of 60 per, whatever it is, it doesn't say, that's a bad graph, now that I'm thinking about it. When the density was 60, then what was the birth rate? And the book would see 60 and there and say, okay, it was about 1.5, right, 1.5 offspring. So anyway, any questions about density, deep set and factors? All right, really quickly and easily, we'll talk about the opposite, density independent factors. Obviously, this is where the intensity is not related to the density, that's all. The nuclear bomb would be a good uh, example of that. The nuclear bomb is going to kill everything, you know, depending on the size of the bomb, it will kill everything within a one mile radius, let's just say that, right? So if you drop a nuclear bomb on New York City, kill everybody in one, one mile radius. It doesn't matter if there's a bunch of people in that one mile or if there's just one person. It's going to kill everything in that one square mile or that one mile radius. That would be density independent. Of course, the book, again, the book examples include weather, right? So if we have a cold snap and it kills a bunch of plants, right? It's going to kill everything that's, um, that's not tolerated, tolerant to that cold snap. Everything, right? It doesn't matter if there's a bunch of them or a few of them, doesn't matter. Also, all these things, floods, fires. So any questions about what, about density, excuse me, density independent factors? It's pretty simple stuff. All right, the book gives this example of these aphids. You can see the numbers, they grow quickly from, I don't know, it's like about a, a spring up until mid-summer, and then maybe it gets too hot, they just can't handle it, so then all of a sudden the population crashes. It doesn't matter. What the population density is, the fact is they can't handle that weather, so they die off. That has nothing to do with uh, the population density. So are there any questions about that? All right, your book also makes a great point and kind of brings the two together, density dependent, density independent, and mentions that in the long term, populations are regulated by a complex interaction of both of those things, right? So density dependent, density independent, these are all having effects on populations. And that's what keeps them 
generally speaking, at uh, carrier capacity. So there are any questions about that? All right, the next thing we're going to learn is also very, very simple. Population cycles. And the only example your book even gives of population cycles are the boom and bust cycles. And you need to recognize the boom and bust cycle when we talk about it. Um, the famous example that your book gives are the snow, snowshoes, hares, and its main predator, the lynx. And you can see when I show you the graph, the populations do for both of them, they boom up, like logistic growth, excuse me, exponential growth, and then they crash. And they go back up, and then they crash. And this is a great example of how populations are affected by density dependent factors and density independent factors. Um, and specifically, your book talks about some of the things that may cause the population crashes would be the winter food shortages, right? So the hares, the rabbit type creatures, maybe they're eating too much, plus things are dying off because it's the winter, so they've starved to death. Um, and when their population crashes, then so does the lynx population, because the lynx eat the hares. So that would cause you know, a reduction due to predator-prey interactions. And of course, when you combine the two, that's what gives us this boom and bust cycle that I'm about to show you. And once I show you, then I'll ask, see if you have any questions. But there we go. So the blue lines are the snowshoe here, the red lines are the links. And it can make sense. Like, so example, you know, using the description your book uses, you can see the population exploded here for the hares. And then maybe because it got so big and because things started getting cold, they just ate all their food, right? So because of that, the population crashed. Meanwhile, you can see that the lynx population kind of rose after the population of the hare started going up. So did the lynx, because they had more food. And then the lynx population crashed. Therefore, the lynx, or excuse me, the hare population crashed. Therefore, the lynx population crashed too, because there goes the food. You can see how these things kind of go hand in hand, right? When the hare population explodes, so does the lynx, because they have more food. When the hare population goes down, so does the lynx, because that's the food. And as always, again, I'm not going to give you this graph on the exam. There's nothing to memorize here. Um, that's just a great example of a boom and bust cycle. So, there are any questions about that? Okay, pretty simple stuff. If you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this video. As a matter of fact, that'll be the next question for the next World of Attendance video. And that brings us to the next main bullet point, the second to last main bullet point of this chapter, which is applications of population ecology. And I love that your book talks about this. So instead of just giving you all this information and all this academic you know, knowledge, this is boom and bust cycles, this is logistic growth, this is exponential growth, and your book actually gets into talking about why that's important to you, why that's important to us as a species. So your book points out, if you've had Bio 108, you know this, if you're ever going to take Bio 108, it's a big theme um, to that course. But natural ecosystems have been converted to those that produce goods and services for humans' benefits, right? So when you think about a farm or, you know, like a cornfield, that's not a natural ecosystem, right? We took what used to be either probably either a field of different types of grass or around here most likely a forest. We cut it down, and now we only grow corn, right? So... We're doing that to benefit us because we need food. But there's some issues with that, right? That has some negative impacts. Um, and that's why we use population ecology. We use it to increase the population of organisms we wish to harvest. So again, in this example I'm using, we want corn, right? So we're doing things that are good for the corn. We're also doing things that are bad for the things that eat the corn, right? So we spray, spray, fertile, um, spray uh, insecticides, for example, to decrease the population of pests, pull weeds, things like that. Um, and another thing we use population ecology to do is save the populations of organisms that are threatened with extinction. Um, I'm going to put a big X to this, not because it's not important, but just because I'm trying to help you focus on the next exam, and none of those will be questions uh, on the exam. This is more of an introduction, right? So it's an introduction of what we're about to talk about, about how population ecology is being put to use. Um, and that boils down to those three things, but we're going to get more specific and give some specific examples of how exactly we do those three things. So any questions so far? All right. First thing we're going to talk about is the conservation of endangered species. And I bet this would be very easy to you, a very easy concept, because I'm sure you've heard about endangered species your whole life. Some of you have been writing about them for independent work, so this should be pretty simple. At first, the concept is simple, but then your book gives a slightly, slightly complicated um, example. I'm not going to ask you any questions about this. 
but it, to me it's very interesting because it's kind of counterintuitive. And it's about a woodpecker. This particular woodpecker requires long leaf wood forest where it drills nests and holes in pine trees, right? So it requires a very specific type of uh, pine tree um, and a very specific kind of ecosystem, very specific forest, long leaf pine forest. Um, so what's happened recently is the woodpecker numbers have gone down. This has been due to logging, which makes sense, right? Because if you cut down the trees, it needs the trees to live, it's a nest, so obviously you're taking away its home. That's going to lead to the numbers declining. Um, we're also cutting down trees, not just for the sake of the trees, but we're cutting them down for food, right? So we cut down the trees, like I mentioned earlier, maybe put a, a, a cornfield. So we're losing them to that. And here's where it gets a little bit more interesting, a little bit more complicated. And this is where your book is such a great example of how we're using population ecology. Because if you just use, I don't know, if you just use common sense, it might lead you to wrong conclusions and wrong uh, decisions. So this third one's a big one here. Another reason we're learning, losing these woodpeckers is because they're putting out fires. Now think about that. These first two bullet points are saying we're losing woodpeckers because we're destroying the trees, basically, right? We're logging our agriculture. And this third one, we're saying we're losing them because we're putting out fires. And what do fires do? Fires destroy trees. So hopefully if you're thinking, and you're not just dozed out, or dazed out right now because it's Monday morning, hopefully if you're thinking right now, you're like, well, that's weird. How is it that putting out fires is killing the, uh, or negatively affecting the woodpeckers? And let's talk about why that is. It's because when these birds are breeding, they abandon their nests when the vegetation gets too thick and too high, specifically about 15 feet, right? So they like to drill their little holes into the tree for their nest about 15 feet high. So what happens, or your book even gives some reasons, why is it like that? Well. It requires a clear flight path between trees, so if it gets too high and too thick, it can't fly. Um, so this critical habitat was protected with a maintenance program that includes controlled fires. So because of them studying this species and understanding how it works, you know, then they said, well, wait a minute, we need to actually have these fires. Not only should we allow the fires to happen, but we should do them, some prescribed burnings. And that's what it. And here's a picture you can see. This is what it looks like when it's overgrown. This is what it looks like when you have some natural fires or some prescribed fires and you let it burn. So this is nature's way. Like sometimes fires are natural. And when humans get involved and do things, it might sound counterintuitive because it might sound good, hey, put out the fires. That makes sense, right? But that's not always the best case. So that's just a really good example of how population ecology is used and how you actually need to understand and study a species. Because again, to me, common sense would say, uh oh, these things are endangered. They live in this habitat. There's fires. Let's put out the fires, right? Those things are endangered. But that is actually, you know, not what's what you need not to do. You need to let the fires burn. So, are there any questions about that example? All right, here's another really big one for us because you might be thinking, well, who cares about these woodpeckers? And I guess I wouldn't blame you. But where it gets a little bit more important for the survival of the human species is this next one, which is sustainable resource management. Here's something I might ask you, this first bullet point right here. According to the logistic growth, right, so the one that goes up and kind of evens out, the fastest growth occurs when the population is at one half of carrying capacity. So you need to know that. Graphic for you here. You should be very familiar with this, because we just talked about it. Is that S-shaped curve, right? And it evens out that point right there of the population that's carrying capacity CC. So I'll abbreviate it as. But what we're saying is the fastest growth of the population is right about there, right in the half the place spot. I didn't draw it perfectly, but hopefully you can see that, right? Hopefully you can see that growth population growth was really slow to begin with, and then it just accelerated, and then it starts slowing down again once it hits carrying capacity. And you might be wondering, well, who cares about that? Well, the people who are making the laws and the regulations about how many fish we can catch and when we can catch them and how many deer you can kill this hunting season, that's right, right? You're, they're trying to hit that sweet spot. So you want the population. First of all, you need to understand the number of the population, the deer population, the trout population, whatever it is that you're uh, making these regulations for. You need to understand what the carrying capacity is, and then you need to try to hit that, that sweet spot, that halfway point. So, and again, that's not as easy as it sounds, because as we talked about earlier in this chapter on Friday, you know, a lot of times you're estimating a population. You can't even, you can't go out and count every deer 
or count every brook, or excuse me, uh, brook trout, for example, right? You have to estimate it. So it's really kind of hard to do. And this is why you have to pay for fishing license, for example, and hunting license, because that money goes towards paying people who figure these things out, and scientists who go out and do the estimates. Anyway, um, the book also points out that it's not perfect. That's what this bullet point is here. Because the logistic model, this, this model right here, assumes that the growth rate and the carrying capacity is stable over time. So that's another thing that makes it difficult. It's not like you can just figure out, all right, well, here's the carrying capacity of this species. Therefore, the sweet spot is that halfway point. But what you don't know, those things change, right? So sometimes carrying capacity increases. Sometimes carrying capacity decreases. Sometimes, again, you're just making estimates of the population. Well, you're always making estimates. You don't have an exact count, unless we're talking about humans. So sometimes you may overestimate the size of the population or underestimate the size of the population. And that's this next thing that the book talks about. It gives an actual example. It points out that fish are still the only wild animal that are hunted at a large scale. And that might sound weird to you. It's like, oh, I've got plenty of people who hunt deer. But that's different, right? That's not even large scale. When we're talking about large scale, we're talking about that picture that I just accidentally showed you again at the beginning of uh, today's lecture, right? They have those big nets. They're hunting at a large scale. And because of this, as we mentioned, they are very vulnerable to overharvesting. And before I even get into it, I'll say what I said earlier, just to make sure you understand the importance of this. It's not just like, oh no, we're gonna lose the fish, how sad for them, and how a little bit sad for us because then we can't eat them, but that's okay, we have other things to eat. It's not like that, they're a part of an ecosystem. So when you lose one species, it affects all the species that um, interact with it. Anyway, here's the actual book again. Um, the North Atlantic Cod Fishery, right? So way back in the day, their estimation of the population was too high. So again, like I said, they're trying to hit that sweet spot. Draw it again. There's the S-shaped curve. That's horrible. There's the carrying capacity, right? Carrying capacity. There's the sweet spot halfway between, right? So again, their estimates were too high. So that means, let's say, maybe they thought the population was right here where that dot is, right? But in all actuality, maybe it was right here. So because they thought it was too high, they said, all right, you know, you fishing boats can capture this many pounds of fish, right? Because they were trying to get it down to that sweet spot. But because they overestimated the population size, what happens is, or what happened is, they actually went below the sweet spot, right? So that's one of the problems. Another problem, and I don't know why you don't even get into this much detail, but there was a practice of discarding young cod, right? So they catch them, they're too small, they throw them back in the water. Uh, that actually caused a higher mortality rate than predicted. Actually, that doesn't make sense. I don't remember why they put that down. Because again, it's about population ecology. Somebody had to study the species because it just makes sense. Common sense, I would think, would tell you, all right, you catch them, if they're not big enough, throw them back in the water. But they've learned when after studying the, uh, the species that that's actually not really good for them. They don't usually make it. So then they had to come up with other ways of working the way uh, around that problem. Um, so because of all these things, the fishery collapsed in 1992, and as of the day um, when this book was published, it is still not recovered. So I'm going to put a big X to this just to indicate that there will be no specifics about this on the exam. It's just an example of how population ecology is important and how if you screw it up, it could be bad, right? So this happened because we mismanaged the fishery, right? Humans mismanaged it. We had wrong estimations. We didn't know enough about the species. We allowed them to get, you know, we caught too many, and then the population crashed, and it has yet to recover. Anyway, that brings me to this. Basically, I just said this, but here it is in writing. Sustainable catch rates cannot be estimated without knowing those life history traits. So remember, life history stuff is stuff we talked about on Friday. Uh, the age of first reproduction. How many offspring they have when they reproduce? How often between, you know, how much time in between reproducing, right? These are things, you know, at what age do they die? All these things, you need to understand that to be able to um, get sustainable catch rates. So your book points out that population ecology alone is not sufficient, and that's what we're talking about. This whole chapter in here is about population ecology. So that in itself is not enough. Um, we also need we require uh, the knowledge of community and ecosystem characteristics. And I find it funny that your book even mentions this because we haven't talked about that yet. That's the next chapter. Community and ecosystem characteristics, that's the next chapter. And basically what it means, and you're going to learn more about it in the next chapter, what I'm saying here is when you talk about population ecology, you're just looking at that fish, right? Again, 
At what age do they start reproducing? How many offspring do they have when they reproduce? How long is it between uh, broods? That's their population ecology. But what we're saying here is that in itself isn't enough. You need to take a step back and look at the big picture. Like, what about the things that eat those fish? What do they do? What about the things that fish eats? You know, you have to understand all these things to be able to have uh, sustainable catch rates. And again, it's not just because we might run out of fish, which would in itself suck, but if these things start going extinct, then also the problem is you're going to have problems with those ecosystems, which has a large cascading effect that we talk about in bio on the weight. Anyway, are there any questions about sustainable resource management? All right, here's the next word for attendance. Fish this is the next word for attendance. The next thing we're going to talk about is pretty simple, too. You're probably already familiar with this. There's a lot of them in West Virginia. Who here knows what a stink bug is? Probably all of you. Just some of you might not be paying any attention. But a stink bug is an invasive species, right? So that's a great example of an invasive species. But let's talk about it academically, just in case you didn't know. I'll give you some official definitions here. Organisms that are introduced to non-native habitats can have devastating effects on ecosystems. So that's kind of an introduction. There's nothing to write, write down there. That's why I put the, the star there. They don't always have devastating effects on ecosystems, but they can. For example, if you were to take a, an alligator and drop it off in, in a mountain stream in Alaska, the alligator is probably going to die pretty quickly, right? So you did introduce a non-native habitat um, to an ecosystem, but it's probably not going to have a devastating effect. It's probably going to die right away. But sometimes they can have a devastating effect. And that is when they are technically called an invasive species. So if they're just coming around, hanging out, not making much of a fuss, or not really affecting things, it's not tech, it's more of a, uh, a non-native uh, species. But once it starts causing damage, that's when we consider it an invasive species. Um, your book defines it as a non-native species that has spread far beyond its original point of introduction. So again, if you take two alligators from Alaska, then one's male, one's female. You put, or excuse me, from Florida, drop them in Alaska. They're probably not going to spread far beyond their original point of introduction because they're probably going to die. So they will not be invasive, even though they're not native, because they just wouldn't make it. Um, but some things do make it. And if you're, if you're like me, to me, this is slightly interesting. You can look this up for independent work. Like for example, in the Everglades, um, pythons are big ones. Pythons are invasive. People buy them as pets. They don't want them anymore. They say, hey, they probably like the Everglades. It's kind of swampy out here. And what happens is they really do like the Everglades because it really is swampy. And there's no natural predators. And nothing there has evolved to evade them as a predator, so they just go they just go wild. And we'll actually talk about those a little bit more in the upcoming uh, slides. Anyway, invasive species cause environmental or economic damage by colonizing and dominating suitable habitats. Does anybody recognize any of those pictures down there? Yeah, I mean, not specifically that specific picture or that specific picture, but this scenario. Has anybody ever seen the documentary on these? You can look it up for independent work if you want. And I think if you download the PowerPoint and click those pictures, there's actually short videos that talk about it. But this is, I'm not going to ask you anything about this on the exam. This is interesting to me. These are called Asian carps. They're invasive. I think they're like in Indiana, Illinois, somewhere around there. And not only are they invasive, but they're really weird. So when you drive a boat, the noise makes them freak out. And that's what this is. See, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of them jumping out of the water. And sometimes, that's what this picture is, sometimes people get hit. Very often people get hit on the boats because they're just driving along and the fish jump out and it hits them. Um, this person's trying to make some fun of it. Right? He's got some protective gear on, he's water skiing, he's got a net to try to catch him in the air. And uh, a little basketball goal there, basketball hoop with a bucket under it. Anyway, just an example. Your book gets pretty specific here. Now, I'm not going to ask you these specific numbers. One, because this is the 100 level course, and two, because this book is a little bit older, so I'm sure these numbers are a little bit different by now. But in the US, there are hundreds of invasive species, um, and that includes plants, mammals, birds, fish, arthropods, mollusks, um, fungi, and there's a, for every type of organism you can imagine. Um, there are some uh, examples of invasive species from them. And back when this book was uh, published, the estimated cost was $137 billion a year. That's a lot of money. And again, if you want to look it up for independent work, maybe you can give me the new number. That's what it was when it was published then. What is it now? How much damage are invasive species causing now? Especially with inflation. 
right? Because dollars don't dollars aren't what they used to be. Anyway, like I already said earlier, not every species that's been introduced becomes successful, which would be bad, right? That's once it's successful, and that means it's taken over, and that's bad for us and bad for the uh, for the environment. Not everyone that survives becomes invasive. These two bullet points kind of say the same thing. Um, and your book points out that there's no single explanation of why a non-native species turns into a damaging pest, but invasive species typically exhibit opportunistic life history. <coughs> I put a circle around that one because you should know that for the exam. That's something that might be a question on exam. Do invasive species normally exhibit opportunistic life history? or equilibrium? And the answer is opportunistic. So let's give an example. And I love these examples that you put gives because it really scratches the surface of common sense and just misleads you. Common sense can mislead you uh, unless you know a little bit more about it. And the first example your book gives is something called cheatgrass. Cheatgrass is an invasive species. Now try to picture this. I mean, here we are in a biology class, and I'm teaching you this, so it's going to make sense here. But just try to imagine if you weren't in biology class, and if you were just where this stuff is happening, and so you're taking some tour, and some guy's like, yep, this is cheatgrass, this is an invasive species, and you're looking at it, and probably think, well, who cares, right? Unless you're some kind of expert on grass, you're probably like, okay, this looks normal to me, it is a field of grass. So if you keep that in the back of your mind, that, again, this isn't always common sense, because common sense might tell you what's the matter if we have a bunch of grass coming in, right? Because isn't grass just grass? Well, let's talk about it. First of all, the book points out where it's from, or not where it's from, but where this invasion is happening, which is the arid western regions of the United States, right? It's where we're having this problem. This cheap grass now covers millions of acres that used to be dominated by native grasses and sagebrush. So again, if you're not an expert on that, this might not even bother you. You could see it and be like, oh, uh, yeah, that looks like a grassy field. I don't understand what the problem is. Even I probably, without studying this, would look at it and probably think, everything looks normal here. That's a bunch of grass. So, yeah, it's covering millions of acres. How is it successful? Well, they figured out. Like, they figured out what made cheap grass invasive. First of all, it produces seeds earlier than the stuff it's competing for, right? So it's getting, up, getting the offspring out there earlier. And not only does it do it earlier, but it puts more seeds out there. So it's out-competing the native grasses, right? So by reproducing sooner and reproducing more, it's just out-competing the native grasses. Another problem here, and this is where it gets a little bit less common sense, because again, common sense might just tell you a field of grass is okay, it's a field of grass. Here's where it becomes a problem. This cheatgrass, which is not from the arid western United States, this is where it's a problem, it matures in the early summer when the native grasses don't do that. And the problem with it uh, maturing in, um, in the early summer, is it becomes extremely dry, as you might imagine, in the arid western hot portions of the United States. And that creates abundant fuel that is easily ignited by lightning or a stray spark. So in other words, the native grasses, it was a, it was a little bit harder to, uh, to start a fire. Here, it's a lot easier, right? Because this thing's dying earlier, it's drier. Um, and there's also more to it because not only are the, the fires more likely to happen, but they're more intense and they're more frequent. So the, the late native plants, they're not, uh, they're not evolved to handle that, right? So we just talked about those pine trees where the woodpecker is, right? And we talked about how fires were good, let the fires happen. Because some plants are evolved, and some organisms, not just plants, some uh, organisms are evolved to tolerate fire. Some of them are not. So for example, again, these. The native plants, the native grasses, were not evolved to handle the intensity and frequency of cheap, cheap grass fires. So between out competing them with reproduction and then killing them off with the fires, after a few fire cycles, the native plants were essentially gone. So that means, again, this might not seem, this might not be common sense to you because you just might think, okay, who cares? We got rid of some grasses, but we have new grasses, right? What's the problem? Well, the problem is, that there's things, it's an ecosystem, right? So it's not just the native grasses we lost, but we also lost over 150 species of birds and mammals who are now without food and shelter, right? Because those birds and mammals and all those things we evolved to take advantage of the native grasses, not the cheap grass. Um, and then your book also points out that climate change has made things worse because cheap grass responds more efficiently to uh, the increased CO2 levels than the 
than the other plants do. So again, they grow quicker. Um, and because they're growing quicker, right, that just means they're bigger. And what happens when you have big dead plants? Well, it's just more stuff to become fire. So as the climate changes and as we get more CO2 and as things get hotter and drier in that region, then we're going to have more fires and the fires are going to be bigger. So again, this is all pretty big consequences. And that might not be obvious to the average person just looking out at a grass of field and, or a field of grass and saying, yeah, that looks normal to me, it's a field of grass. This is again why population ecology is important, because we need to understand these things. Anyway, there's a picture of cheatgrass, that's what it looks like. Here's the one I was talking about earlier, the Burmese python, that's another example. So I just gave you a plant example. Here's an animal example, they've been set loose in South Florida, specifically the Everglades. Um, and again, the reason that's bad is because they're eating native species. So yes, not only are they not native, but they're killing the native species, the native birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians. All these things, the native ones, are not evolved to, uh, to avoid being eaten by those pythons. Anyway, that's just an example. Um, if you click, if you download this PowerPoint and click this uh, picture, it'll actually show you a short video about this problem of the Pythons in South Florida. So, any, any questions about that? I'll put a big X to this to indicate I'm not going to ask you specifically any questions about Burmese pythons on the exam. All right. Now, next to the or on to the next bullet point. Again, we're still talking about applications of population ecology. The next thing we're going to quickly talk about is the biological control of pests. And this is kind of related to invasive species because, as I've already kind of hinted at. Invasive species, sometimes the reason they're so successful, you know, some of the reasons they outcompete the native species, is first of all, there's no pathogens. Not always, but sometimes, right? So, for example, the stink bugs, they don't have any natural predators around here. Of course, that's not a pathogen. That'd be here predators. But yes, sometimes it's diseases, right? So sometimes a species will come over and that, the, the diseases that it had back home aren't here anymore. So it's just prior to Of course, sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes something comes and it's a native pathogen that kills them and they never become um, invasive to begin with because of that. But anyway, there's a lack of pathogens, there's a lack of predators sometimes, like I already mentioned earlier with the, uh, with the stink bugs, they don't have any natural predators around here, so that's why they're out competing. And of course, if we're not talking about animals and we're talking about plants instead, then sometimes it's the herbivores, right? The lack of herbivores. And I'll actually give you a book example of um, an invasive plant that doesn't have any native herbivores, and that's actually how they got rid of it, was by using biological control. So let's talk about what biological control is. You need to know this for the exam. It is the release of a natural enemy to attack a pest population. So really just think about it. We're talking about pest control, but then just throwing in the word biological. So instead of just saying, all right, we're gonna spray some chemicals or you know, put out some mouse traps, or whatever. We're using biological control, which means we're using living things to attack other living things. That's the part you need to know. For the exam, I would say this first bullet point right there is more important than the second. Yes, biological control is used to control insects, weeds, and other organisms that we're going to talk about soon. But the most important thing you need to understand is biological control is when we're using living things to take care of other living things. Any questions so far? All right, the next word for attendance, and maybe even extra credit for those of you who are here. You can email me this word. Um, value is the next word. Anyway, your book is an, an effective example, uh, an example of how sometimes, or uh, one of the times when this actually worked. It doesn't always work. An example of something called St. John's Ward, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, it's a long-lived European weed that has invaded the western United States and overgrown millions of acres of rangelands and pastures. Um, and again, this is a lot like the cheatgrass discussion, right? So if you're not familiar with this, if you're not educated in this, you might just look out and see a field of St. John's wort and think, okay, this looks normal to me. It's a field of, of plants, a field of grass-looking stuff. But it's not okay, and you have to be educated in it to know. So for example, when this took over, this St. John's wort took over, well, first of all, St. John's wort is not edible for the livestock. 
and it's apple feeding the plants that were edible. So now all these livestock that people depend on for food and uh, for money, right? They're dying off because they have nothing to eat because the St. John's wort was taking over. So they did some research. They figured out, well, they probably already knew, but they knew where St. John's wort was from. They went and did some studies there and figured it out. What is the native um, herbivore or the St. John's wort over there in Europe? Is something called a leaf beetle. So they said, well, why don't we just take those things from over there, bring them over here since they eat it. And there you go. So now, once they brought in the leaf beetles, this thing was no longer without a native um, herbivore because we brought the native herbivore back to it. And what happened? That reduced the weed to less than 5%, right? So it killed most of it. And now the land's value is back to where it used to be because there are edible plants. Therefore, the livestock can eat it. Therefore, the ranchers and everybody involved in that has a, their, their livelihood back. And of course, we who eat beef also have our beef back. So any questions about this example? Put a big X through here to indicate. Not going to ask you any questions specifically about St. John's work. It's just an example of how biological control has worked. But it doesn't always work. Your book also gives an example of a failure. And the book example are Indian mongooses. I don't know if you know what they are, but they are fierce carnivores. They eat rats. Well, they eat a lot of things. That's actually the problem. But the fact that they eat rats is important to this conversation because that's why they were introduced. Right? So back where they grow, any place that they grow sugar cane, they were having problems with the rats, which then themselves, rats themselves are usually invasive, depending on where you're talking about, especially on an island habitat, like the Caribbean or Hawaii, Hawaiian islands. So they take these uh, mongooses, they set them free, hey, go eat those rats. And they did. But they did eat the rats. But the problem is they ate a lot more than that, right? So not only did they eat the rats like they were supposed to, but then they started eating other things, and they themselves became invasive because they were eating native reptiles, native amphibians, native birds, right? They were all eating them, but they were eating all the native stuff because they were really, really good at killing. Uh, too good, in fact. So they killed what they were supposed to and then started killing other stuff. And here's what one looks like. There it is. It's about to eat that native bird egg. It's been caught. It's still going to eat it anyway, probably. Anyway, any questions about the, the, the mongoose? I'll just go back up here and again put it next to there to indicate I'm not going to ask you any specific questions about the new mongoose. It is just a great example of how biological control does not always work. Um, your book then comes to the process of science. As always, we are going to skip it. As always, I recommend reading it. Are any of you from the South? I don't remember. None of you, I guess? All right. Anyway, if you're from the South, you're probably already very familiar with Kudzu. Um, I'm not even going to read it. You can read about this. It's an invasive weed. It looks like this. And it's actually starting to show up in West Virginia, I noticed. Um, anyway, you can read about it if you want. Ask me questions if you want. There'll be no questions about it on the exam. Here we go. And this brings us to integrated pest management. I'll go ahead and tell you right now, I pay close attention, because when I first introduced biological control of pests, that probably didn't seem that complicated, right? We're using living things to eliminate other living things. Pretty simple when it's by itself. But now I'm introducing you to another concept. And these two concepts will be slightly easy to confuse because integrated pest management also involves a little bit of uh, biological control of pests. So make sure you understand the difference here. Again, like I already said earlier, agriculture operations create their own highly managed ecosystems. So again, if you cut down a field of uh, trees because you want to plant uh, a field of corn, right, you are going to create a highly managed ecosystem, right? So you're going to know exactly where these corn plants are grown. You're going to control exactly when they get watered. You're going to control exactly when they get uh, harvested. You're going to control, you know, the pests that are allowed to live in them. All these things are highly, highly controlled. Um, and your book also points out some of the, the effects of that. First of all, they have genetically similar individuals, which is what we call monoculture, which might not sound like a big deal to you, but it is. Because again, like I've used flu and COVID as an example, I'm sure you guys all know somebody who's had the flu, but a lot of people survive it, right? They kill some people, some people survive it because we're genetically different, right? So the same thing with plants. If they're all very, very closely related, and if you have a pathogen that comes in that's going to kill one of the plants, most likely going to kill all of them because they're all susceptible to it. Um, not only that, 
they're also planted, planted very close to each other. So if one of them gets a pathogen, you know, one, if one of them gets a disease, it's really close to the next. So it'll get it, and then it'll go on, so on, so on, and so forth, because they're so close. And because of that, because also not just pathogens, but the fact that they're close to each other, it functions as a banquet for plant-eating animals and pathogenic bacteria, right? So the fact that they're so close to each other and the fact that they're monoculture um, is very bad. Um, like invasive species, most crop pests have opportunistic life histories. You should know that too. I already told you that you need to know that invasive species usually have an opportunistic life history. So there I'm telling you again. But now I'm also telling you that most crop pests have an opportunistic life history. And remember, an opportunistic life history allows them to rapidly take advantage of a favorable habitat. So very important bullet point there. Anyway, the history of agriculture has many examples of devastating pest outbreaks. I'm not going to talk about them. You only need to know from the exam. The boll weevil in, in cotton is one example. Um, your book talks, talks about it on, on, on end. There's a picture of the boll weevil. So let's talk about actual pest, pest, integrated pest management. How do we get rid of it? Well, pesticides are one thing, but pesticides have a downfall. You know what? We got less than a minute. Let's just say the last word for attendance is kill. And when we get back on Wednesday, we will finish up talking about integrated pest management. So I'll be online and in my office if you guys need me for office hours. We'll try to get caught up with uh, great. Yeah, you come to office so I can I gotta get out of the room for the next class.